Welcome, welcome everybody. Greg Peterson from Urban Farm U, and I'm here tonight with Janice. Hello, Janice. Hello, Greg. Good to see you again. And right back at you. And like we didn't see each other two hours ago in a Zoom meeting, right? Right. <laughs> and I am so excited here tonight because, um, well, I'm going to tell a little side story. When we moved from Phoenix to Asheville, uh, my first thing to get done was, what do I do with all my food scraps? So I was doing a little bit of pot, pit composting, a, and I was at a, a, a farmer's market one day, and I saw this contraption that said urban worm bag on the top. I'm getting chills as I share this, Steve. <laughs> and I looked at it, and it's, it just made sense to me. So I bought one. I've had it for a little over a year. And I have to tell you guys, I have been composting, thermophilic composting. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. And I have been worm composting for over 30 years. And this urban worm bag that Steve created is the most brilliant worm composting system I have ever seen. It, it just works. And it's really cool. You called me the day after that you saw them and you were like, like, oh my God, I saw the coolest thing. You've got to just, you, it's so cool. Yeah. And then you told me the whole story of how you interacted with them. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's, I could definitely be, you know, see you getting excited about this at the, at the event. Yeah. The farmer's market. Exactly. So I, uh, after having it for about six or seven months, I reached out to Steve and got him on the podcast, which you all reheard a couple of weeks ago, we rebroadcasted it. And I convinced him to come and give us a class on worm composting. So the class is on worm composting. And then he'll share a little bit about the worm urban worm bag at the end. Uh, and we'll have a special offer if you're interested and motivated to get your own urban worm bag, we'll, we'll do that. So, you know, so we get before we go into this, I want to ask a quick question of everybody. Okay, please. We're going to do a quick poll. Uh -huh. Have you ever tried worm composting? So, the poll is on the um, oh you can my see gosh. this. It's a quick do it, you can answer it and get some answers. So, um, oh, this is so quick. cool. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Do you see it there, Steve? I do. I do. It, it's, it's, it not, is. it's not letting me vote. <laughs> right. It's not letting. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. It is flying, man. So basically um, the little pop-ups on your screen, the only way to get the pop-up to disappear is to click on it or close it. So we're just really quick. Um, we've got about 85% of people who are watching it right now have answered us. So we've got about right now, 42% of you have said yes, that you have tried worm composting before. And 58% have said no. Wow, so cool. We're going to see how informative this um, presentation is. Oh, it is. We recorded it the other day. It's uh -huh. good. <laughs> All right. Excellent. All right. All right. So Steve is the owner of the Urban Worm Company, a Verma composting related blog, online store, and manufacturer of the Urban Worm Bag. Through the Urban Worm blog, social media, and email interactions with his readers, Steve is a joyful promoter, that is the total truth, of vermicomposting as a means to turn household and commercial waste into highly valuable soil amendments. Steve is a retired military veteran, thank you, sir, for that, and a pilot for Southwest Airlines. So welcome, and anything you want to say before we jump into the class, Steve? No, thank you for the introduction. Thanks for such a, everybody out there, such a, uh, you know, uh, seems like a, a great turnout and uh, some familiar names and some customers I recognize and some people on my email list that I recognize. And nice. we've got some folks from Urban Worm Nation that are, that are, have joined. And uh, I, th I think we have, I see some, some very uh, common names, not that you and I don't sort of, you know, you guys in, in Urban Worm, I'm sure share a lot of the same folks. So yeah, anyway, glad to do this. This has uh, been looking forward Fun. to this. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks awesome. for the introduction. All right, cool. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play the video that we recorded the other day, and then we'll come back and take questions. When you have questions uh, on in the event, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat box. So, all right, let's get on with it, Ms. Janice. Thank you. Interesting. 
All right. Thanks, Greg. It's great to be back with you. Thanks, Janice. Thanks, everybody in the, the urban farm community. This is an introduction to vermicompost. It is only an introduction. <laughs> we are going to talk about the benefits of vermicomposting, the benefits of vermicompost, how to start your own worm bin, talk a little bit about the Urban Worm Company's products. My name is Steve Churchill. I'm the owner of the Urban Worm Company. Started this business in about 2014 just as a blog to help other people get started with vermicomposting. Eventually, I launched my own line of products, which I never intended to do when I started this little venture nine years ago now. Having a lot of fun, meeting a lot of great people like Greg, and looking forward to getting into this topic with you today. So I think it probably helps if we define our terms. Firstly, just what is vermicomposting? Vermicomposting is just the consumption and decomposition of organic waste via an ecosystem. And the ecosystem is the important part of it, of microbes and earthworms, which really makes a very potent organic soil amendment called vermicompost. It's sometimes referred to as worm castings, which is just the worm poop fraction of vermicompost. This stuff is awesome. It's full of organic matter. It's full of microbes, it's full of plant growth hormones and plant available nutrients. And that's an important part. Vermicompost is not heavy in things like nitrogen. What it is heavy in are the things that take the nitrogen that's bound up in the soil that the plants can't use and turns it into plant available nitrogen and to include other uh, macro and micronutrients. So it's very much a facilitator in the soil rather than a direct fertilizer. There's input and output benefits, I think, to vermicomposting. The input benefits are independent of anything, any good stuff that the vermicompost gives you on the back end. The input benefits would include things like reduced landfill use. I'm thinking in the context of food waste, when that food waste goes to the landfill, it doesn't emit carbon dioxide, it emits methane, which is far worse than carbon dioxide. In fact, I've seen anywhere from 25 to 100 times more harmful than carbon dioxide. It doesn't linger in the atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide does, but while it's in the atmosphere, it traps way more heat. Most of the stuff I've seen shows that it traps about 85 times more heat than carbon dioxide. It also, by doing vermicomposting at home, we can reduce carbon emissions from the trash trucks. Food waste tends to be the heaviest household waste that we have because of the water content. So it, it is very, very efficient for us to be recycling this material at home, as opposed to having these trash trucks take our heaviest waste away from our homes for us. And so, and the other thing too, Greg, you've probably seen this, but it's just simply fun. There's something addicting about the idea of having worms take your waste and turn it into something good. There's something therapeutic about it. And it's just fun. You start looking at waste in a different way. Some people look around their home and think, can I vermicompost that? It's, it becomes a little odd at times. Aside from the benefits that you get from the end product of the worm castings, there's just plenty of benefits to the process itself. Amen to that. Yeah. So here are the output benefits. There are a whole lot of things that vermicompost is shown to do. And starting off with just simply promoting plant and root growth, it increases yield. I've seen anywhere from 10 up to 80% difference in yield based on what academic studies that we're looking at. It improves water retention in soil. This is an amazing statistic. Vermicompost or worm castings are organic matter. And for every 1% increase in organic matter in our soil, an acre will hold an extra 25,000 gallons of water. That is really an amazing statistic. And when you think about just the combination of uh, how much synthetic nitrogen we're putting on the ground, plus the fact that our soil doesn't have that much organic matter anymore due to modern agricultural practices. What happens is we get a heavy rain, that soil cannot absorb that water. So it runs off and it takes the nitrogen with it and it goes into our streams and waterways and creates algal blooms like we see in Lake Okeechobee or Lake Erie, the Gulf of Mexico. These are toxic algal blooms that starve our water of oxygen. So you've got fish kills, you've got all sorts of other harmful things happening in the environment due to the fact, in part, that our soils do not have enough organic matter. Vermicompost can also help suppress pests and pathogens. We are trying to culture microbes here. And one of the ways that vermicompost will suppress these pests and pathogens is by creating a very hardy plant and a very hardy soil. Instead of going out and trying to kill the pathogens and be antimicrobial, what we're trying to do is foster the growth of beneficial microbes that will help the plant fight off any attacks from, from the pathogens in the soil. 
Vermicompost are plants grown in vermicompost treated soils. They are also show improved pollination. This is one of the more fascinating things I've learned somewhat recently is wow. that bees will discover plants grown in vermicompost more quickly. They'll visit the plant more often and they will stay longer. And these are statistically significant differences. The improved pollination is another just interesting side effect. Why it's happening, scientists don't really know yet, but they know that it is happening. The other thing too, and this is a big one, is that it makes nutrients more available to the plant. Our soil has plenty of nitrogen. What it has though is the N nitrogen, organically bound nitrogen. What happens is that the microbes in the soil, they help consume this nitrogen, they help consume other microbes, which then releases nitrogen in the form of ammonia and nitrates, which are available to the plant. Now, don't take my word for it though. There are over 40,000, I think there's over 40,000 now, academic studies published on Google Scholar that talk about vermicompost effects on plants and soil. Again, why it's happening, it's a little bit tougher to know that, but there's plenty of evidence that it is happening, that vermicompost is doing great things. I'm gonna get a little bit away from the academic side and show you some pictures. You can see this pretty picture here. I'm gonna show you this next one here. This was taken by my friend, Marianne Smith of Valley View Worms. Um, she's just down the road from you, Greg, in Waynesville. Oh yeah, um, in fact, she's the one I found out about your worm bin from. Ah, okay, wonderful. Marianne's a really good friend of mine. I love this picture that she took, and I kind of doctored it up here for my own purposes and using it with her blessing. But these are cucumber seedlings that she grew. So you can see the control group on the left here with no vermicompost, 5%. And again, these numbers are by volume, 10% and 20%. 20% showing the most growth. On it. And I would, of course, tell anybody, hey, give this a shot and see how it goes for you. This next one here is just two heads of lettuce, one grown in vermicompost and one not. You can see the one on the right is significantly bigger. These pictures come from Christy Christie at Black Diamond Vermicompost, another friend of mine. This next picture is also from Christy, and we talk about plant growth and root growth. This appears to be basil, and you can just see the root structure and just, of course, these are in potted plants, so I'm sure those roots would be extending even further out into the soil if this was grown in the ground, but you can just see what the roots are looking like on the left, which was grown in vermicompost, while the one on the right was not. Now, when, um, you, say, when you say grown in vermicompost, you don't mean 100%. No, 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 I don't mean in 100%. Grown in, in soil that's treated with vermicompost. Yep, and that substitution rate's typically going to be about 10 to 20%. Of, of the soil medium that you're using, about 10% of it typically is what captures the most benefit for vermicompost, and that's likely what happened here. And by vermicompost, I don't mean with worms actively, I'm, I mean the finished product, which we also could call worm castings. It's a little bit unfortunate that vermicomposting has the word composting in it because it, I think it gives people a little bit the wrong idea, and people often think that they can mix mix composting and vermicomposting, sort of put worms in a hot pile. So I wanna talk about the differences between the two. With regular kind of hot composting, what we're looking for are high temperatures, which use thermophilic, that's I believe that's Greek or Latin for heat loving bacteria. Composting is dependent on volume. That's why you see larger piles. In fact, you have to have kind of a large pile in order to trap the heat required to get the thermophilic bacteria to begin flourishing. You need to turn a compost pile in order to introduce oxygen to it, or you need to have a way of delivering oxygen to the pile, often through what's called aerated static pile composting, where you pump oxygen into the pile. Those microbes are rapidly consuming the oxygen inside that pile, and you need to continue to turn it in order to keep those, those microbes. Com hot compost takes a longer time to finish. It needs to go through a curing process. You've got kind of a hot process, but you also need to go through a curing process at the end to make sure that that compost is fully stable. It needs to be outdoors or ventilated just because of the heat and the vapor that it produces. Vermicomposting happens at much lower temperatures using mesophilic or medium heat loving bacteria. It also is dependent on surface area instead of volume. So the composting worms tend to stay in the top eight to 12 inches of their habitat. I think it's probably more like six to eight inches of their habitat. And so they won't work a pile top to bottom. And so because of that, it's much more dependent on surface area, again, rather than volume. These piles do not need to be turned. The worms often are simply aerating this very loose material themselves anyway. Vermicompost can be finished in eight to 12 weeks. So as opposed to the months that it might take for a hot compost pile to be finished, 
you, you're looking at a much shorter time frame for vermicompost. You often can't do the same volume of material, but you can consider it to be a finished product within eight to 12 weeks, especially you know, for something like food waste. There are no vapors. This can be done indoors. So some basics here with vermicomposting, and I, you're going to hear me touch on some very common themes along the way. What we're doing with vermicomposting is we're mimicking nature. We're mimicking what composting worms do for us in nature. So this isn't a factory. We're cooking and not baking. It's, I think it's important to understand that we don't have to micromanage this process. If we set the table for the worms to do what they do best, they are going to mimic nature just fine for us. And one of the ways we do that is we create an ecosystem. And, and so what do I mean by that? By an ecosystem, it's not a monoculture. Of course, we're going to have worms and organic matter in there, but it's a requirement to have microbes and, and mainly bacteria in, inside of a worm bin. You can also culture fungi as well, but with a, especially with things like food waste, it's mostly the bacteria that are going to be breaking down that waste. Every now and then you may have things like mites, you may have things like springtails, you may have other kind of micro arthropods that are helping to shred and compost. We call these comp co-composters uh, in your worm bin that only make the worm bin a more diverse and thriving ecosystem. It's not just worms eating our food waste and pooping out these worm castings. As far as what we feed the worms, we want to be feeding them non-meat and non-dairy food waste. We want to stick with the easy stuff, the fruit and vegetable waste, which a lot of us create plenty of anyway. So we want to make sure that we're not putting meat or dairy waste into our worm bins. We also want to use composting worms only. A lot of people think, well, composting worms, man, they're really expensive. They're like 50 bucks a pound. And yes, they are. They are kind of expensive, but they are about the only worms that you can use for composting. So there are about 7,000 species of earthworms on planet Earth. Only about five to seven of them are any good at doing composting. And so we want these epigeic composting worms only. We can't be using the worms that we find in our garden soil in a worm bin. It just, they just don't, they, they don't swarm organic matter and they don't like living as closely to one another as composting worms do. The other thing that's very important as we go through this is stay patient. A lot of people get into worm composting and they want to save the world today. That's a recipe for disaster in a worm bin. It's going to make you get off to a bad start. You're going to get a stinky bin, possibly lots of fruit flies. And you're just going to say, this isn't for me and give it up. And that's what I want to try to prevent with, with, with webinars like this. So um, on the price of the worms, though, let's just touch on that really quickly. Mm -hmm. That's a one-time investment. Mm -hmm. I bought a pound yes. of worms a little over a year ago when I moved to Asheville. And there's probably three or four pounds in my worm bin now. Right. These worms will reproduce very well. And so, yes, that is a one-time investment. Of course, you can take those worms. You could sort of, once you get a certain population, if you want to start another worm bin, it's not like you need to start with new worms. You can just take the worms that you got in your bin and start the second one with it. So that's a good point that you brought up is that it is a one-time thing. So uh, moving on, uh, talking about the basics of starting up a worm bin, the first thing you need to do is choose your bin or your container. We're going to get to a couple options here in a second. You then want to add an initial bedding layer and food waste. And bedding is a carbon-rich material. Think of things like paper waste, food waste, peat moss, cocoa core. You could use compost, although it's not terribly carbon-rich, but it is a good stable, stable material. Dead leaves and a mix of all of these things creates a bedding. And this stuff is organic matter. So the worms are going to consider it a food at some point after it begins breaking down. But you want to make sure that you've got a, a good initial bedding layer in your worm bin with just a little bit of food waste. Once you do this, you're going to put the food waste in there, but you're not going to put the worms in yet. Then you're going to order the worms. And you're going to want to order enough worms for about one half to one pound per square foot of vermicomposting area. For most commercial worm bins, that's going to mean about one pound. You then want to feed small amounts of food waste. Again, we're not trying to save the earth today. We're trying to get a thriving worm bin going. And so we want to be very, very conservative with what we feed the worm bin. Number one, because we may not have gotten that thriving ecosystem up to speed yet with the worms, with the microbes. So their ability to process now is considerably less than their ability to process months down the road. And Greg, you've probably seen this acceleration happen where the worms seem to be breaking things down more quickly the further on that you get as your bin matures. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I've been able to add more compostables over time. Yep. 
So one way that we keep ourselves safe is by adding two parts of bedding to one part food waste. One of the common mistakes that people make is that they start with the initial bedding layer, but they consider the bedding the same way that you might consider bedding in a chicken coop or where you've got to change it out. No, you never have to change it out. You just have to keep adding it. So you want to add two parts bedding to one part food waste as you move along and then only accelerate the feedings as appropriate using your eyes and your nose to tell you if things are going well or not. <laughs> so you can do vermicomposting in anything as simple as a Rubbermaid bin, which you see here on the top left. Below that Rubbermaid bin is a Worm Factory 360. It's what a lot of people think of when they think of a worm bin. It's these stackable worm farms. The top right is a Hungry bin. That's a large worm bin, plastic worm bin. And then you've got the Urban Worm Bag, which you see at the bottom right. So regardless of the kind of bin that you choose, you're going to start with that initial bedding layer with just a little bit of food waste. I like to tell people, especially in a bin like the Urban Worm Bag, which tends to be a little bit deep, start with that 8 to 12 inches of bedding, carbon-rich, slow food. This is the boring stuff, the stuff that you, you know, if you look on YouTube of what people are vermicomposting with, you often see worms just swarming cantaloupe, which looks great, but that cantaloupe is also breaking down very quickly. You're going to soon attract fruit flies and you're going to have a goopy mess on your hands if you don't have that bedding to help deaden that mixture and then absorb that, uh, that water that it gets released from those really water heavy, heavy wastes. So with that first eight to 12 inches of bedding, we want to add just one to two cups of food waste. And again, non-meat, non-dairy food waste. And then we're just going to wait. And by wait, we're, I like to tell people just wait one to two weeks before you even get worms because we're trying to culture those microbes. And Greg, I want to touch on this real fast because this is the first time we've seen it and I didn't mention it before. In this presentation, we'll see, we'll see these links. It'll say click to read. Obviously, we're not going to go read them right now. I would like to share this presentation with your audience so they can go, they can look at this on their own and they can go read some of these resources on their own. So now once, once we've waited a bit, and even as we begin our waiting process, we can order reds. I would suggest a red wiggler mix or pure red wigglers. So the red wiggler mix is going to be mostly red wigglers, but you could have some similar species mixed in. They are going to be composting worms, but they may not all be red wigglers. And I would tell people, err on the side of maybe ordering maybe a little too few rather than too many. I would say one half to one pound per square foot of worms for your worm bin. That's what I started mine with. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Food waste, again, I'm going to mention non-meat, non-dairy food waste. Lots of things you can feed your worms. Even inside, even with the non-meat, non-dairy, there are some things maybe that you can avoid. And the video here is going to go into what some of those are. I would tell you, start slow. Don't save the world today. But these worms take forever to starve. So <laughs> you, you cannot feed your worms for four months. And you know what? You're going to come back and see them. They will not be dead. They may be a little smaller, but you don't need to feed these worms as much as you think. You're going to see things on the internet that talk about worms eating 50 to 100% of their weight every day. That is especially at 100%. That is simply untrue. People following rules like that tends to result in way overfeeding their worm bins, creating a stinky mess in their bin, and then they stop vermicomposting altogether. You should expect a much more modest feeding regimen, maybe 25 to 33% of worm weight is what I've heard. And that's under like optimum conditions. We'll talk about those conditions here in a second. You can chop, blend, or puree your food. If you do that, especially if you blend or puree, you're going to be surprised to see that that stuff is a watery, goopy mess. So that should tell you how much water is stored in food waste, which should talk talk to you a little bit about needing to add bedding as you go on to help absorb that water as it breaks down. I'm going to now show me starting up an urban worm bag. This was taken up a couple years ago. I've started with an initial layer here of coconut core. You can kind of see the fibers there. This is about a six inch layer inside an urban worm bag, eight inch layer. You're going to see me then introduce some paper waste. And this is really what I'm going to be starting the, starting the urban worm bag with. Obviously, I'm just giving you a picture of what the paper waste looks like, going to be dumping a lot more in. And what we're trying to do is just diversify the bedding material in there. You can't go wrong with too much bedding. You can go wrong really quickly with not enough bedding. So we're just going to mix this around here a little bit, which is also that coconut core was pretty moist, but that dry bedding is going to need a little bit of water here. And if you do find that you want to add water to your worm bin, do not pour water in, spray it in like you saw there. 
Here I'm showing you a little bit of food waste. You got some carrots, some apple cores, coffee grounds with the filter. The filter is basically a bedding type material, right? Just gonna take that, dump it into the worm bin and we're gonna mix it around. I don't like the idea of just having this clump of food waste sitting there with bedding around it. I like to mix everything around and that kind of prevents fruit flies. And we're just gonna let this sit for about a week before we, before we order the worms. Got the worms here. I think there's a very small amount of worms and this was for demonstration purposes only. This is probably only about a quarter pound of worms, but you can see they're nice and healthy and thriving. And we're just gonna dump these things right in. They are gonna work their way right down into the, into the worm bin and they are gonna get to work. And then that is in a nutshell, the start of a worm bin. Now, as we maintain the worm bin that we've started, we wanna keep temperatures about where we're comfortable, right? So the microbes that we wanna culture are these mesophilic microbes and they are best in temperatures between 55 to 90 degrees. And I think right in the middle of that, it's somewhere in the 70s to 80s is probably the best. You can control this the most easily by keeping your worm bin inside your home if possible. I think that utility rooms and basements for those who have them is a great place. Some people can even do garages. Garages can get a little bit warm, but it's the temperature inside the vermicompost, which is what matters. It's not the ambient temperature. So if you have a nice full worm bin, that temperature is not gonna fluctuate inside your vermicompost as quickly as the ambient air does. A lot of our listeners are gonna be in the desert Southwest, I would guess. Yes. Keeping a worm bin in a garage in the desert Southwest is a surefire way to fail. Just because it gets in, way too hot in Phoenix, yes. In Phoenix, yeah, in Phoenix for sure. And a lot of that is also because it's hot and you don't have ventilation. I, yeah. I, there are people that will do this in Phoenix under shade and it's going to work okay for them as long as the worm bin does not get direct sunlight. If you're in somewhere with a breezy location and you're protected from direct sunlight, you should be okay. And again, it's the temperature inside the vermicompost that you need to measure, not the ambient air temperature. Uh, moving on to moisture, we want our moisture in our vermicompost to be between 60 to 70 percent. Well, the way that we tell, and I've got a video here, is that if you pick up a handful of your vermicompost and you squeeze it, you get just a drop or two coming out between your knuckles, that is about 68 to 70 percent you at least want it to be tacky and sort of stick together. That's just a great way of knowing what 60 to 70% is. And this speaks to kneading bedding because most of the vegetable waste is 85 to 90%. So we need that dry bedding that we add with our food waste in order to sop up that moisture, to bring that overall moisture content down to 60 to 70%. We also want our pH to be neutral to slightly acidic. And I think that if your bedding is okay, this is something I honestly never pay attention to because my bedding levels actually are always remain high in my worm bin. So I don't pay that much attention to pH. I'm going to just show you here. This is just a picture of the, you see on the left of the urban worm thermometer taking the temperature in, in our, in a worm bin, which is right about 85 degrees. And then I'll just show you this video here. This is me squeezing. This is a little tough to see, but squeezing vermicompost. And you can see between my knuckles, a uh, little bit of water that, that kind of was squeezing down there. Uh, so again, that squeeze test is just your best way. I wouldn't worry about moisture meters or anything fancy like that. All right. So as far as feeding, again, two parts bedding to one part food waste, I'd say use your sight and your smell for feedback as to when to feed again. So if you're smelling foul odors from your worm bin, that means you have fermentation or anaerobic oxygenless decomposition happening. If that's happening, then you've overdone it. I would dial back on the feeding, actually not feed at all for probably two weeks. I would add some dry bedding and then just continue to monitor. But if it looks like the worms are attacking your food waste and they are breaking it down into something that's maybe not recognizable as food waste anymore, then that's a good sign that you can go ahead and feed again. So I've got a video here that's going to show feeding and then me basically forgetting to feed for a month. This is an interesting video. You can see some chunky stuff in there. You can see some banana peels. And it's a chunky top here. I'm going to reopen the same thing maybe a week later or so. And you can see things are much flatter. You can see, I think that's an avocado peel or something. And uh, this bin is now ready to feed. You saw a little bit of mold there. And that's, uh, that's just fine. That's another good decomposer. This is the same bin. <laughs> this is just what the worms and the microbes will eventually do. And you can see the worms are smaller now, but it is just absolutely fragmented and just eating everything inside the bin. And so I overdid it there. I just simply forgot. I think we went on vacation. 
but that's what they're gonna turn this stuff into. I wanna talk about the most common mistakes that you're gonna have in a worm bin. The first one is, and these are all really related, overfeeding. People wanna save the world today. Just be patient, don't overfeed your bin, because if you do, you're gonna end up making a bin that is way too wet. If you put especially too much food waste in there, then you are just gonna have a, a goopy, soppy, stinking mess, and we don't want that. And so that all really stems from impatience, right? A worm bin is something that we need to exercise some patience with in order to have the best results. A resource, they can download the PDF that I put together. It's just rookie mistakes that everyone makes. It covers these three mistakes plus three or four more that should keep the, the worm composter safe on their permacomposting journey. I want to talk real fast about pests that we see in the bin. A lot of people think that anything that's not a worm in their worm bin is a pest. That's not true. Some of these pests are simply good co-composters, if you will. And we should be happy to have them really, there's very few of these that are really a problem in a bin. And this resource here on the right is a, is a kind of a compendium of pests and problems that you might have in a worm bin and which ones are really pests, and which ones are friends and which are, are foes. I want to cover odors again. If things smell bad in your bin, then you've overdone it on the feeding. If you see worms on the walls of your worm bin, this is something that alarms people, but is not really a problem. Worms love moisture. And one of the things that's going to happen as you put food waste in your worm bin is that, the, the, that you're going to get a lot of condensation on the walls of your bin. The worms are going to be perfectly happy to be in that microbe rich water <laughs> that is on the walls of your worm bin. If, if you have all the worms trying to escape at once, then you've done something really wrong in your bin. But if you've got what would amount to just dozens of worms on the walls of your bin, not a problem. One way of knowing you're doing things well is that worms are reproducing. You're going to see some cocoons in your worm bin. You won't see thousands of them at once. Those are likely going to be mites. A lot of people think that they're seeing worm eggs and what they're actually seeing is mites. But you're going to see these little lemon-shaped, lemon-colored, even yellow-colored cocoons in a worm bin. The other thing, too, and this, again, gets to wetness, you want, we want to discourage leachate production. Leachate is not worm tea. It's simply if leachate is the excess liquid that drips out of the bottom of a worm bin, specifically those stackable worm bins, which have the tap. Those taps are not meant to tell you to make tea. They are meant to relieve you of your own mistakes. So as food waste breaks down, it releases water and that's why we need that bedding. We do not wanna be promoting leachate production in a worm bin. And really, if it's whether it's leachate or whether it's bad odors or some pests, especially things like mites in the worm bin, Bedding and airflow kind of cures all. I would just add some dry bedding. I would open up the top of your worm bin and, and let things air out a little bit. And that will solve a lot of, of problems. It's kind of like, a, you know, first do no harm. And you're not going to do any harm with a little more airflow and, and more bedding. Common misconceptions. I've covered these already. Worms are not going to eat 100% of their own weight. Leachate is not worm tea. Worm tea is a deliberately brewed liquid that you suspend worm castings inside of an aerating mixture of, of water and possibly some foods that help spur the growth of microbes. The stuff that drips out the bottom of a worm bin is not worm tea. The other thing too is that composting worms can aerate your garden. Greg, I've probably turned away thousands and thousands of dollars of business from people who want to buy worms for the purpose of putting in their garden. Right. Uh, so these are not soil dwelling worms anyway. And the, the other thing too is worms are a symptom of good soil. They're not necessarily the cause of it. If you have a lot of organic matter in your soil, you're gonna have a lot of worms. Assuming that your soil is in contact with native soil, you're gonna be attracting worms to your garden, even worms to your kind of on ground raised bed. You'll get plenty of worms if you just add the organic matter, which means adding the food. If you build the good soil, they will come. <clears throat> I wanna talk real fast about the worm bin harvest. And, how you harvest a worm bin often depends on how you are vermicomposting. If you're doing vermicomposting in a Rubbermaid bin or a five gallon bucket, this is kind of what's called a batch method of vermicomposting where you are going to be emptying your worm bin all at once and then restarting a worm bin, which means taking that material, dumping it out, and then trying to figure out a way of getting the worms separated from the worm castings and vice versa. One thing you can do is simply manually pull worms out of vermicompost. It's kind of tedious, but if you've got a good podcast you want to listen to and you got 
plenty of time <laughs> to be my guest. The other one, this is an interesting one, is a light method. Worms don't like light. They are repelled by it. So one thing you can do is make one or several piles of vermicompost, put them all under a bright light, and you can start scraping worm-free vermicompost off of the top and sides of that pile. And at, you basically keep scraping until you, until you see worms. Then you move on to the next pile, do the same until you see worms. Maybe do the third pile till you see worms. And by then, the first pile, the worms have dived down into the pile a little bit more. And you can continue to scrape that vermicompost away. That's a little bit of a, a tedious way of doing it, but it's, it, it works all the same. You can also sometimes bait worms into something. Think of an onion bag. You can put some fresh food waste in there, uh, especially if your worm bin has not been fed recently. You can take the fresh food waste, put it in an onion bag, put it down into your vermicompost, give it a, probably three or four days. A lot of the worms are going to make their way into that onion bag, and you can sort of pull that bag out and and your vermicompost will still have some worms in it, but it's going to have a lot less than it had before. The other way is you can use a screen. There are different trays that you can buy. This thing you see here on the right, this is way beyond what most people would want or need, but it is a trommel, which is a cylinder that just spins and takes the fine stuff. It goes through the mesh and then the coarser material and the worms make their way out of the bottom. Continuous flow does not require you to disrupt the ecosystem of worms and microbes that are doing the hard work for you. These things are harvested from the bottom for something like an urban worm bag or a hungry bin or for something like the Worm Factory 360, this is, or one of the stackable trays, this is when you harvest the bottom tray. In theory, worms should be moving higher into areas of fresher, wetter waste, and the, the drier, more finished stuff is left at the bottom. If you do mismanage your bin, continuous flow doesn't work if you've allowed that water to seep its way to the bottom because worms, like I said, are attracted to water. But with continuous flow, if you manage that moisture correctly, you can harvest from the bottom, and allow the worms to keep working. You don't have to stop. You don't have to disrupt your ecosystem and build it up again. So, so continuous flow basically means you put worm food at the top, the worms travel up, and the worm castings come out of the bottom. Correct. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. I want to talk about screening, whether it's even necessary to take your vermicompost and process it. Normally, if you're putting it through a quarter inch to a one eighth inch screen, it makes it look great, but it also may harm the biology, especially if you had a fungal vermicompost, because you start tearing up those filaments in the fungi if you screen it. I think it's not needed in most cases. A lot of people want a nice coffee grounds looking worm cast. That's what's most commercially available. It's what's commercially expected by a lot of customers, but it doesn't mean you need that in order to deliver the benefits of vermicompost in your garden. If it's got some unprocessed chunks and wood chips, that's fine. That stuff can go in your garden just fine. I wanna talk about harvesting the urban worm bag here specifically. You can see kind of the macro picture on the left, but also how this thing it opens from the bottom. And I've got another video here. I'm actually just gonna to go to the next thing, which allows you to see the pictures a little more easily. For the urban worm bag specifically, we're just gonna be releasing buckles, pulling the Velcro off as we go from left to right on top remove the fully removable bottom. We can use that removable bottom as a catch, and then we would release this drawstring and then take those worm castings into that, to that bottom catch. And I've got a video here showing the same thing in real time. And I'll just narrate this here. You see me releasing the buckles. There are four buckles to be released. And we take the Velcro, we remove that, and we're gonna fully remove this, uh, this bottom here. And just, we can place it underneath or put it aside. Sometimes I like to tell people, just use a mortar tray underneath. It's a little bit bigger. I'm gonna release this drawstring and you're gonna see some castings come out of here. The castings you get are likely gonna be much wetter and stickier. So sometimes it requires thumping on the sides of the bag or even reaching up inside. You're gonna see me tighten that drawstring. Then you can see what the end product of vermicomposting looks like. Now, I will tell you that most of you are going to make a little bit more of less homogenous of an end product there, but that is a harvest of the urban worm bag in a nutshell. And that's okay. To, that's absolutely fine. It's absolutely fine. So now that we have our castings, how do we apply them? This is its own webinar. You're going to apply in one of three ways with worm casting. You can apply on the soil, in the soil, or on the plants. 
On the soil, we're talking about doing something called top dressing or side dressing. You might want to top dress your soil with a half inch to an inch of this, an inch of worm castings. That is going to be probably an appropriate application. For the home vermicomposter, you're probably just going to do whatever you got, right? Whatever you harvest can just go right on your soil. If you're buying worm castings, then you probably want to let that determine how much you're going to use. So if you did want to top dress, for instance, a four foot by eight foot raised bed, then you're looking at a one inch. That's a significant amount of worm casting, but it does give you a great benefit if you're doing top dressing. For side dressing, you might use a half a cup of worm castings basically applied to the stem right around the root zone of the plant. If you're talking in the soil, you're amending your current soil with, uh, with worm castings, or if you're building up your soil from scratch, you want to start with around a 10% substitution rate by volume. So if you, you saw the pictures that we had before from Marianne, 10% captures most of the benefit that you get with worm castings in your soil. At 20%, you start to see a diminishing returns and above 20%, you start to see negative returns if you use too much in terms of worm castings. It, it retains too much water, so you don't get the proper drainage. There's plant growth regulators and hormones in there. And if you just put too much of that stuff in there, it actually becomes harmful to the growing process. And if you want to use castings directly on the plants, you can use this by with a liquid application of tea or extract. Again, that's another episode here for tea and worms, uh, tea and extract. But again, on the soil, in the soil, and on the plants are the ways that you would apply your worm castings. I want to point you to some, some helpful resources, but I've got a blog that I've worked really hard on for the last, we'll call it eight, nine years. And then we've also got a really growing YouTube channel. And I've got some videos on there that I think that you guys will find very helpful. Finally, I want to leave you all. Again, I'm a big fan of what Greg is doing here at Urban Farm, and I'd like to support that. We do have a special landing page for you at urbanwormcompany.com forward slash urban farm. That is going to take you to a page where, you know, I give you a little bit of a hello and what kind of discount that you'll receive. I originally told Greg, I'd give you a 5% discount, but I said, you know what, let's just do the 10% and let's take care of your listeners. So Greg, Greg Thank you. fought well for you guys. You fought valiantly, but if you use urban farm 10 at checkout, that is going to get you 10% off of almost all of our products. Maybe not some of the bulk products like bulk worm castings, but, but this is our way of supporting what the urban farm podcast and Greg's efforts. So Thank you. with that, again, I'm Steve Churchill, urbanwormcompany.com forward slash urban farm. And if anybody wants to email me with, with questions, you can email me at steve at urbanwormcompany.com. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that, Steve. And uh, you're welcome. Thank you. We have bunches of questions here. Um, one of the things that I what are you saying, Jen? I'm like looking at all the happy, flappy hearts and everything. I've got some great questions too. So I'm hoping that we have some, some of the questions that come through are the same as mine. Right. Right. Um, I do want to, and we address this uh, um, after we done, after we finished recording last time. And I really want to address it live. And that's papers that we use in the worm bin. And I've always been very conscious about what kind of carbon I use, especially when we're talking about copier paper, printer paper, because, and I just looked it up, uh, toners are made from naphthia, a petrochemical related gasoline, which uh, others, while others include styrene acrylate. And I think it's really important that the stuff that goes through your paper shredder does not go in your compost pile or in your uh, worm bin because it's got those that chemicals in it. Now, um, you talked also about newspapers and newspapers are good because they use soy ink, right? I think most inks are actually soy. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the ones that you, I, I, I will tell you that I am probably not as fastidious about that as you are. Uh -huh. As many of your, I just, I just don't want there to be friction in the pro in the process for me personally. Got it. And I uh, just with, with the folks that I'm trying to get into this, I think if you want to avoid it, avoid it. But if it's going to mean not doing it because there are too many of those sort of obstacles, yeah. I, 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 I'd rather people, I'd rather people put those things into a worm bin 
Uh, but I actually think though that most most inks, not just newsprint, but most inks are soy based, in, at least in North America. Um, right. So that way, and we're so, talking inks. We're not talking about toner cartridges. I'm talking about the stuff that comes out of our printer. Of your toner. of our printers. Okay. Exactly, okay. and that's uh, that right. stuff you you want to do the best that you can to avoid using that for anything. That being exactly. said, um, I was on one of your Wiggle Wednesdays about six months ago. And you talked about using a paper shredder to shred. To shred paper. <laughs> to shred cardboard. Our <laughs> cardboard. Oh, car- oh, cardboard. Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, uh, there are some inexpensive, I think for about $70, you can get a, a cross cut shredder, which, which shreds it into little squares. You don't get the strips. I think most shredders now are cross cut shredders. Um, it does a great job with, with paper and a, a, I have a 12 sheet. It's actually right, right at my feet, a yep. uh, 12 sheet shredder, uh, that, um, does a really good job with the cardboard, uh, like normal kind of corrugated cardboard, like you get from, you know, Amazon boxes, delivery boxes and whatnot. Exactly. And, For and, sure. you know, who turned me on to that originally was Zach Brooks out at Arizona worm farms. Yep. He said he spreads <laughs> all those and uses it for his cardboard. So uh, right. All right. So um, anonymous says, "I'm just going to start. We got a bunch of questions, so yeah, let's." And I'm yeah. just, I, I will, I don't, I do not want to filibuster. I will have to try to make myself answer these very quickly. And I'm sorry if it's going to be quick and maybe incomplete or not as thorough as people want. But I, I want to get to as many as we can. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So anonymous <laughs> says, "You mentioned that vermicomposting is ready in eight to twelve weeks. The USDA recommends at least four months. What can you say about the difference?" I, so I actually was trying to find, I, I saw that and I'm not as familiar with USDA guidance on this as mm-hmm. maybe I should be. Um, the, the four months may be for, it may be for curing time. There is, there, there is um, immature worm castings that you can make where there's higher levels of nitrogen that you might have, than you might have in a, in a more mature vermicompost. That may be where they say for the best end product, make sure it goes 12 weeks. Um, it can be done in as little as, as eight. It all depends on what you're vermicomposting. And in a, in, a, in a worm bin, if you're vermicomposting food waste and, and paper waste, stuff that has not already started breaking down, and you need to take that from its, you know, from its initial state down to worm castings, that's going to take a lot longer than eight weeks for that stuff to fully, fully break down. Yeah. Uh, but if you're starting with something like leaf mold, for instance, if you go turn out to, you know, take that crumbly stuff, the, the leaves, basically last year's leaves that have already started breaking down, you put that in a worm bin, that's going to become warm castings much more quickly. So, you know, it really, what's, it really what's finished. De- right. Yes. It depends yep. on the, the consistency of what you're putting in there. I just use straight. Uh, worm cast or straight food scraps out of the kitchen. I don't do anything to them. And I had cardboard on top. And I'm getting about, you know, two, two to three harvests a year. Okay. You, all right. Yep. So I, I know Marianne Smith will harvest once every week or two. Um, oh, she okay. is using leaf mold. She will, <laughs> she will use leaf mold and you can put all a whole lot of that stuff in there. Breaks down very quickly. The worms, worms like it. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a good um, question, and I I don't I can't explain the difference for me, but I maybe I'm just not adhering to USDA standards either. So yeah, there you go. It's all good. Whatever we're doing, Anonymous also wants to know when should we stop. This is a really good question. When should we stop feeding the bin and let it mature? Well, it, it if you're using. It, that's the beauty of continuous flow, for instance. So if, exactly. if you're using a ru- if you're using a rubber made bin, you want to let it get to a point where the worms have essentially eaten everything to where there's nothing that's recognizable as food waste anymore. It it has a very flat surface. It looks like it's fuzzy, almost like the top of a pool table. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be if you're using a rubber made bin or a, a five gallon bucket or something like that. That's what you want the top to look like, assuming everything else underneath it has been has been eaten but with with a continuous flow bin you're harvesting that stuff from the bottom so whatever the stuff is on top is a little bit irrelevant as long as the stuff below it has been broken down so you can right you can go ahead and ha- harvest the castings out of out of the bottom the, the top is 
doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah. HP wants to know two parts bedding, one part food waste. Is that by volume or weight? That is by, yes. well, te te technically by mass, but weight. Yes. Okay. All right. We have bunches of I'm questions. Sorry, did, hold on a second. By did volume? I say, or? It, no, I'm sorry. That's by volume. That's by, vo that's by volume. Okay. Yep. Great. So, yep. If you have so two, basically you... two, two handful, two handfuls of bedding, one handful of, and that is a guideline because you could have something that doesn't, and a lot of this is about water. It's not about like carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's about water and the absorbency of that bedding to absorb the water from that food waste as it breaks down. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. That is, that is by volume. Cool. All right. So yeah. we have a bunch of questions in here. Uh, Anonymous says, how do you keep them alive when the summer months get over 100 degrees? Uh, and Wait says, I live in Phoenix. It's hot here. Will these work survive? Will they work here? Um, I might be a better person to answer some of this, but what are you thinking? Well, the first thing I want to say is it's the, it's the, it's the temperature inside the vermicompost that matters. Yeah. So it's not it's the outside, of course, is going to affect the inside, but it's the it's the it's the it's the inside of the vermicompost that matters. So you want a nice big full worm bin, which is going to provide you something called thermal mass, which is going to allow you to kind of withstand extreme temperatures outside the bin for a while. So if let's just say, for instance, in Phoenix, and let's just say it's or any other hot area, you are going to have vermicompost that is cooler during the day than the outside temperature but possibly warmer at night than the outside temperature. So it, it, it's, it's not going to fluctuate with the ambient temperature as, as quickly. Um, one thing you can do uh, because we're entering the hot season, especially since I know a lot of your uh, uh, audience is in Phoenix, you can take uh, ice, uh, uh, ice bottles or, you know, water bottles full of ice and put them in your worm bin that are just going to help radiate that that coolness to the rest of the bin. You don't want to use ice, but you want to use uh, ice. You don't want to use ice because it's going to melt and it's going to give you a mess. But you want to use uh, fr you know frozen bottles, uh, you know water bottles are are good ways to keep it keep it cool. And also, again, a lot of this, Greg, just not to not to belabor the point. If you want to if you want to do this in a hot climate, it cannot be exposed to directly to the sun. And it should be in an area where you get a lot of that, a lot of airflow, uh, if, if possible, it's not, it's not feasible for everybody, but that's, that's going to be a big help. Yeah. Garages, enclosed garages aren't going to work in Phoenix. I know this for sure. Probably not. My yep. flow through worm bin that I had when I was in Phoenix, I, I built one out of wood um, and it was two foot by three foot by three foot tall. Um, and I used the water bottle method in there to keep it cool in the summertime. And it was shaded 100% of the time. Yep. And yep. you can you just always... sometimes in, in, in a place like Phoenix, you sort of have to limp, limp your bin through the winter or through yep. the summer. It's and in a place exactly. like Philadelphia, I have to really Philadelphia is pretty mild, but say in Canada, you have to limp it through the winter <laughs> yeah. you know i'm gonna jump in here and i'm gonna send a quick poll to everyone to see where they're located all right cool all right you guys keep going all right keep going with more questions okay good uh alicia wants to know can vermiculite or sand be used for bedding i would think sand would be too heavy yeah, sand, well, yeah, and, and sand is a kind of mineral, as is vermiculite. So it's a kind of a flaky mineral thing. You, th those would be, you, there's probably no reason to use vermiculite in a worm bin. Sand would be used for grit, which helps with aids in the worm's digestion. It would not be a, it would not be a bedding. And if I can just add, somebody also asked about sawdust. Can you use sawdust as a bedding? Sawdust is great. It's very high in carbon. Sawdust, if you, if we're talking about especially the things that aren't if they're really, really, if it's really, really fine sawdust, it's great for carbon, but it's, but it can be compacted and it can, it, it, it's, it doesn't add the bulk that you need that you might get with things like wood chips or even uh, cardboard. So it can get matted and anaerobic possibly uh, more quickly than other. Well, and here, here's the other thing. If they're cutting things that aren't just a hundred percent wood, 
So these composite woods, anything with glues in them, anything like that, you don't want to use sawdust from that stuff. That's mm -hmm. another yeah. chemical impact point. Yep. Taylor, I'm going to answer this one real quick. Taylor says, what about placing a bin under the house? She's in Arizona. I say, go for it. Try it out. Let us know how it works. Yep. Um, Jewel says, in one in a one person household some weeks i have to trash a lot of greens because i haven't eaten them fast enough and other weeks i have nothing can i be successful with half a pound of worms so your half a pound of worms assuming your bin is is a normal let's just say a normal size bin let's let's say it's it's 20 inches by 20 inches or more you're going to have a lot more than half a pound half a pound of worms you're going to start with the, 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 a worm bin with with half a pound of worms is soon going to be a worm bin with probably two pounds of worms, three pounds of worms, which is going to increase right. the processing capacity. As does the as does the growth of that ecosystem of bacteria that are actually starting the decomposition for you. So so you're going to be able to a, a mature worm bin with a thriving ecosystem of those microbes and earthworms is going to be able to process a lot more quickly. That's why again I say don't try to save the world today because you're going to have a mess on your hands. Uh, you will be able to to increase over time the amount that you're able to put in your worm bin. So the, the answer is yes, eventually. Yeah. So can I jump in there? Because that actually applies to me. Is a one person who eats grains household uh, going to be producing worm castings that often? How much would we be working? Because we won't be putting that much into it. It's not that it, that it would be able to com compost more, but would we be worth it to have it? I think it would be worth it to have it, especially because, yes. mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's yes. not, it's not just, it's not just food waste that you can put in there. It's paper waste. It's cardboard waste, especially cardboard. There are people that have, have done almost primarily cardboard worms. Worms really like cardboard for some reason. And I think it, it's actually the corrugations, the corrugated yep. cardboard. It's yep. the glues in uh, the glues as they break down the worms. I, I don't know not if it's it. the sugars in it or, or what, but I think that it's still a good thing to do, Janice, even if you're not producing that much, uh, because you can do the, like we talked about with the, with the leaf mold, um, shredded paper, other, other wastes from your house. And, you know, the one thing, let me just say about food waste. And I said it in the video, food waste is the heaviest household waste that you have because oh. of the water. And so instead of, instead of having a carbon burning truck, take your water, your 80% 85% water laden food waste away from your house where it's going to emit methane, just keep it there. You're saving kind of, you're, you're, you're saving really in many different ways, you know, from the transportation to the landfill. And then of course, what that food waste is going to do in the landfill. Um, so even if it's less than normal, I think it's still worth it. Awesome. Uh, just for re reference, we have a 60% of the audience is in a hot climate. 40% is in a calm climate with seasons. Perfect. Richard says composite woods would be very high in arsenic. There you go. You don't want that in our stuff. Um, I was told, Beverly says, um, and we have 48 questions to go. So let's, I want to stay on top of this. <laughs> um, Beverly says, I was told to add ground up eggshells for helping the worm's ability to digest and move food through the system. Yes. So, and then the ground up eggshells also will, uh, will help, uh, you know, buffer that, that pH, uh, yeah. as well. And so what the grit does when the worms eat, the worms don't have teeth. What they do is they take in grit that they actually, the grit, they sort of bring into their bodies and it helps squeeze against, uh, you know, against their, the, the walls of their, um, you know, their intestinal cavities and then kind of crushes that, that grit helps crush that food and prepare it for digestion. So, um, and, and a ground up eggshells help with that. They are a, a source of that grit. Cool. All right. So one word answers, grass clippings. It is a nitrogen. It is a green. It will become a brown very quickly. It's going to, it's going to reservedly. Yes. But you use it very sparingly because it will get very hot in your, in your worm bed. Yeah, I would I would say probably not because it does go hot really fast. What about toilet paper and facial tissues? I think it breaks down so quickly that no problem whatsoever. Yeah, right. Um, 
Let's see here. What about chicken manure with hay in it? Chicken manure is also very hot, very high in nitrogen. It's about yeah. the highest nitrogen. I think that is, it's even more, it's even hotter in terms of nitrogen than grass clippings. So be be careful with, with chicken manure. I think yeah. mixed with those carbons, you're going to be fine. But I think that's a great thing to sort of pre-compost first. Just go ahead and pile it up, let it kind of cook through a little bit, and then put it in your in your bin in small quantities. Yeah. Daria wants to know cardboard is food or bedding? Bedding. bedding. Now, right. bedding is also food. It's just slow food. So fast food is the stuff we normally think of as food, food waste, manure, nitrogen-rich things that break down quickly. Carbon or bedding is not like bedding for other animals because other animals don't eat their bedding necessarily. Worms right. do. So if stuff's going to break down, it is food, but it's a slow food and it's what we would call bedding. Cool. So I'm just going to sidestep here, Janice. Will you put in the chat box the link for people to... Already on it. All right, perfect. Thank you. Because we do have a 10% off on the worm bin and worm bin supplies. Uh, so if you're if you're motivated, you can go do that now. Um, Mike and Gene want to know, can worms overpopulate? Great question. Um, no, uh, they are good self-regulators. Worms will stop reproducing um, when conditions aren't conducive to a greater population. So if they sense yeah. that there is uh, too little food, they sense that there's too little space, they will just slow down their own reproduction. So, so no. Perfect. That's a great question. Uh, Anonymous wants to know if I want a vermicompost rich in fungi, which food should I choose? Woody material, very high carbon woody material, things like things like wood chips, um, just woody material. That's what fungi like to break nice. down. That's how they're going to proliferate. That's why that's why and, and most most vermicomposts are going to be manure based and they're going to be food waste based. Uh, those those vermicomposts tend to be bacterial. Um, mm -hmm. But if you have a uh, if you have a very woody material, that is a way to, to help kind of culture that. Fun, uh, you know, culture that fungi. The other thing too is when an an an, an older vermicompost may be more fungal because of that as well. So oh, right. it, it just takes a lot longer to to culture fungi than it does bacteria. So you often see higher lar higher fungal counts in older vermicompost where it's been kind of let to to grow a bit more. But again, assuming that you had fungal foods in there. Right. In the vermicompost. Nice. Jewel wants to know what bin size should she order? You just have one size, right? The urban worm bag bin size. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, again, we, I, 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 however anybody wants to do this is fine. Um, most, most bins are going to be, I believe the worm factory 360 is something like about 18 inches by 18 inches, something like that. Urban worm bag is about 22 inches by 22 inches at the top. Um, so that's, you're going to get about, let's just say two and a half to three and a half square feet of vermicomposting area in most worm bins. Um, it's funny, I've got a poster, I've got a video that I'll be releasing on different sizes of, of, uh, of, of worm bins. And most are, you know, if you, if you had a, a, a Rubbermaid bin, for instance, like an 18 gallon or 10 gallon Rubbermaid bin, that's going to be about 20 inches by about 14 inches across something, something like that. So, you know, I, there aren't that many really different sizes when it comes to the, you know, yeah, commercially so available. And buy, really, buy the urban, urban worm bin. It's one size. <laughs> one size. <laughs> cool. Um, did we touch on enough the uh, fruit flies? Why did the fruit flies show up? That's just adding too much wet, right? Well, it's, it's too much wet. It's, it's, you probably, there's probably a too rich of too rich of a mixture in there. You probably need more bedding in there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fruit flies are, 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 are attracted to fermentation um, and things that are kind of starting to rot a little bit. The mm -hmm. other, so, so if you can sort of deaden that mixture with more bedding and also bury your food waste underneath bedding, uh, that can help make that food waste a harder target for fruit flies to lay their eggs on. Here's the other thing too, is, is that your, your food waste may have had the fruit fly larva on it before it ever went into your worm bin. So if you're one of those types of folks like I am, I'm a lazy vermicomposter. I have a bucket outside of my, uh, outside of my, my, you know, patio 
I put my food waste and paper waste in there. I just let it sit there. The fruit flies can lay their eggs on it. And I take that stuff and I put it in my urban worm bag and it, it, it's going to have, it's going to have fruit flies at, at times. But if you're doing this in the home, you can, you can sort of, there are a few things you can do. One thing is you can freeze your food waste. Freezing your food waste would kill any of those larvae on there. Right. The other yep. thing it's going to do is it's is it's going to help break up the cell walls. It's your food waste is going to break down more quickly once it once it thaws because that freezing expands that water, breaks the cell walls, and then once your uh, food waste starts breaking down in your worm bin, uh, it's gonna it's gonna disintegrate much more quickly. And without the, uh, you know, without the fruit fly larva, it doesn't mean you can't still attract fruit flies into your worm bin that way, but freezing your food waste is a good way to get around, get around fruit flies. Perfect. Um, <laughs> do you know what a worm blanket is? I, yes. Yeah, so a worm blanket is one of the products I sell. It's, it's a jute fabric blanket that's, it is biodegradable. It will degrade over the course of about three to four months. Um, you lay it on top and it's going to provide a little bit of, uh, a little bit of insulation, but trap also traps some heat. It's it's Got kind it. of a I, I, I there. I have a lot of people that really really like them. I would say it's one of the probably least necessary things that you would need uh, in a in a worm bin. Um, and, and but do uh, we, folks, do we folks want to really, wet it? I would not wet it. No. Okay. Um, it, it would just make it break down more quickly. I I don't I don't wet it. If if the vermicompost underneath is wet enough, then you don't need to wet a worm blanket. Yeah. Jewel wants to know about uh, worms breaking down citrus. I don't, I don't put citrus or avocados in my worm bin just because it takes too long. What are your thoughts on that? I think that, I think it's fine. You know, one thing that citrus will do, citrus will get moldy very quickly, which is more alarming visually than it is actually when it comes to in practice, mold is it's just another way of breaking things down and, and, it, and, and citrus seems to attract mold um much more than other other types of waste i i think all i think all things in moderation um a lot of people do just fine with citrus it's one of those things i make enough waste with other in other ways that i don't put it in my bin although yeah. i also don't i there's there's also a big difference between peels and like half a grapefruit, for instance, the, the, where the, where you've got the meat and stuff in there. I, yeah. I do actually put like clementine peels and stuff. I eat a lot of clementines, and I will put those in the worm bin. It's fine. I, it's just it's one of those things. Like, which what would you choose first? I would probably not choose citrus first. Uh, you right. know, considering the coffee grounds, apple cores, banana peels, the safer foods like yeah. that. Perfect. All right. Well, and I eat four to six in season. I eat four to six navel oranges a day. That just would overpower my bin. Like <laughs> probably, like yes, that. that would maybe be a bit too much. <laughs> so Debbie wants to know what about winter weather in Prescott? It gets down to 13 degrees outside in the garage and in the garage and basement. It's, it's not much warmer. I, I took your, cause I'm in Asheville and for the mm -hmm. winter, I took your suggestion and I bought a seed mat and put the seed mat yes. on top of my worm bin. And that's, yep. uh, and that's just an electrical mat heater that you can buy on Amazon. Do you sell them on your website? I, I have a link to, to Amazon on my website. It looks like it's a product to buy, but it actually sends you to Amazon to buy it. It's something I yeah. would like to carry. Um, the one that fits the urban worm bag is 20 inches by 20 inches. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I actually have a, a thermostat with it too, that will sort of control the heat of the, the surface of the vermicompost. Um, it just delivers a nice low level heat. It, it will eventually dry out the surface of your vermicompost if you're not sort of continually, I don't say continually, but every few days kind of wetting the surface of the vermicompost that, that heat mat will sort of dry things out a little bit. But it is a great way to get your worm bin through the winter. And, you know, a lot of people will need, will need that in, in uh, climates that aren't Phoenix. <laughs> right. All right. So one minute, 30 seconds per answer now, because we still have 33 okay. to go. Um, any leaves that aren't okay? What about ficus? I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I would probably stay away from uh, black walnut. Um, and mm -hmm. I, anything that's aromatic, I would just be careful with. Yeah. Um, if you, uh, Inga wants to know if you just feed the worm bin with 12 week old compost from a tumbler, 
is the leachate less likely to contain pathogens? Uh, that's a good question. I can't answer I that. Say, I can't. I'd have I to say no. I can't answer that definitively. Honestly, if it's if it's really if it's if it's been composting, and there that's had other ways of, I, I'm not sure that there even should be leachate in that in that compost. Yeah. But maybe just depending on the kind of tumbler, if it was not releasing any of that leachate before you put it in wet, I I just I don't know the I don't know the answer to that. It's probably fine as long as your stuff has truly been composting in a tumbler. If it's just been rotting, it's or anaerobically decomposing. I I can't I yeah, can't say anything that's definitively. Experiment there, so with I, it. Experiment with it. Yep. Uh, Aaron wants to know: Is it possible to mix different worm species in the same bed and get eggs from them? For example, red wigglers and red worms. They they will not they will not interbreed. I, there's some evidence that very similar species like Isenia fetida, which is a red wiggler, and Isenia andre, uh, will will interbreed, but spe worm species will not will not create create babies together. Perfect. Worms are hermaphroditic though, so any any two worms of the same species will be able to mate with each other. There's no male or female worms. Perfect. One of the Atria, interesting things. Atria says, I put one, in, one inch of insulation on the urban worm bag in the winter and summer. She uses a thermometer to check it. Uh, I use a seed warmer in the winter on the top of the bag. She lives in Tucson. There you go. Great. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. Yep. Can I keep, Serenity says, oh, Janice, you moved, you cleared one and then it moved it. Um, Serenity says, can I keep the worms in an unheated garage with freezing temperatures outside? And also, can I put peat moss in instead of cardboard for carbon? Um, yeah, uh, can I keep the worms in an unheated garage with freezing temperatures outside? Probably yeah, want yes, to I don't know where to math. Because I had freezing temperatures here in Asheville and I did add a heating mat and they did just fine. And the heating mat was only what, yeah. 30 bucks or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think without the thermometer, it's some, or without the thermostat, it's something like that. But yes, the, to to answer her question, yes, she can. It's depending on where she is. I would use that. I would use that heat mat. She can use, she can use peat moss. Um, there are some issues with the sustainability of peat moss and how it's uh, how it's pulled yeah. from the the ground. Right. I would rather see somebody using a waste product for for home vermicomposting. But but yes, you you could do that. Like cocoa peat. Like cocoa, yeah, like cocoa core, co cocoa peat. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, Dean App says, sounds like indoors is the most efficient method. Could be. It depends on your situation. Smell wouldn't be an issue if done correctly. Um, very short answer is yes. If you, and this is where bedding comes in. If you're adding that bedding and that sort of two to one ratio by volume, you should be able to get, you should be able to kind of have a, 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 a something that is not going to emit is not going to emit odors. And if you do, then just stop feeding, maybe add a little bit more dry bedding, maybe dry things out just a little bit. And that, that smell should go away. Cool. Linda says, I followed your friend from the Arizona worm farms lesson and made composting bins right in the wood chips. He sells for soil. So we put them right in the ground. Uh, Zach talks mm -hmm. about just burying them in the ground. Um, yes. Let's see here. I yep. fed them faithfully so, the first year. Now I, now I don't feed. Now I don't feed them, and I have zillions of worm and worms in my raised beds. Do I need to add worm compost? No. No. <laughs> You've got worm compost. <laughs> you wow. can be, be, now these are probably native worms that came to the soil because of all of the breaking down organic matter that is the food for the worms. So yeah. um, you attracted worms to your soil. They're going to do better. Those those worms are going to do better in your beds then you could do then honestly you could do yourself and this this just leads to the point that i made in the presentation is you don't want to use composting worms throw them in there either because composting worms need very specific environments like we have in a worm bin they're not great with soil they're not soil dwelling worms so um but that that is great and i'd say say you know you can sign off and and forget about worm composting if you <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding but um uh, if if she's doing that well with the, with the wood chips, and that's a great technique from uh, from from Zach there at Arizona Worm Farm, so I'm I'm glad to right. see that. So it sounds like yeah. she's doing great. Perfect. Um, Susie wants to know where exactly do you place the frozen water bottles in your bin to keep them cool in a hot climate? Uh, the bottom, the top. I would place them right on right top. on right on the top. 
yeah because the worms are going to tend to be in the top of their habitat go ahead and lay them lay them right on top yeah uh alexander says i've had an herbid worm bid for a few years now and i get wet finished compost how can i correct a bag that's too wet i think may i may have killed all the worms because the bag was too wet well don't add so, water yeah don't yeah don't don't add, don't add water. And one thing people just, it's really hard for people to understand how much water is actually stored in our, in our food waste. And so it's it, one thing that's difficult with continuous flow is that you've got, if you've gotten it too wet, it, it can take a couple months to work that stuff out and you've got it. You've got to harvest out that wetness. And sometimes I'll even harvest it, put that stuff right back in the top, even though it's essentially finished. And I will just kind of give it another trip through and it helps even out that, uh, even out that, that, that wetness so you just have to i would add more add more bedding and maybe add more bulky materials add a few wood chips in there that are going to add bulk and add some aeration that's going to help help that uh vermicompost breed just a little bit better cool peter says can i use topsoil i would not use any soil if you use any topsoil as for you might use it a little bit for grit but i would i would not use i would not use topsoil no it just if you do just like just like as a supplement but it should not be the main course as a as a bedding perfect beverly says do you put vegetable fruit waste in that might have wax on it i don't see a problem with that do you i don't really see a problem with it no no like a like a, kind of apples may have sort of yeah. waxy yeah I, I i wouldn't worry about that nor would i um Let's see here. Regina says, received my urban worm bag. Yes. Will the temperature go up in the bag as they break down food or bedding? You might get a little bit of a rise in temperature during after feedings because of the increase of the microbial activity, but you shouldn't get composting going on. Um, and you probably you probably won't, but it should not it should not rise significantly when we fed our big continuous flow system that we had it was a michigan soil works continuous flow um mm -hmm. we would see a rise of the temperatures in the days after but it was very i mean i'm talking three or four degrees and then it would kind of trend back down yep. but we could always see looking at our temperature charts like where we had fed you know it's like once a week there's our there's our bump and then then it, yeah. it comes back down again cool so there's several people asking about mites um, and having okay. too many mites. First of all, mites aren't necessarily bad, are they? No, mites, breaking... mites themselves are not bad. They're, they're what are called like indicator pests. Sometimes they, okay. they're more an indicator that things are maybe a little bit too wet. Mites like a, mites like a very wet environment. Um, so um, mites are good shredders. They are microarthropods. They shred and they fragment the material. They are co-composters in a worm bin. They're generally harmless to worms. I mm -hmm. say generally, if there is a worm that's dying or is otherwise in stress, the mites may attack it. But if, you know, mites are not going to attack a, a population of, of, uh, of healthy worms. Uh, mites just do indicate, and again, I hate to be a, you know, beat this dead horse. It's about the moisture content that's being released yeah. from that food waste. And so if you have a, if you're putting in like a lot of uh, like cantaloupe, you get late in the summer and you get a lot of cantaloupe and put that in a worm bin. Worms love it. So do mites because cantaloupe is like 94% water. Yeah. So they're, they're, you're going to see them, see them pretty quickly. Add more cardboard. There you go. <laughs> Add more cardboard. Christopher wants to know, I built my own stackable bin to harvest from the bottom. Each layer is six inches high. Should they be deeper? I'd say six is the minimum you'd want. Yeah. I think maybe... I think, I think six is fine. I mean, six, I, I wouldn't, I think six, I think six is fine, but six is probably the minimum if I were to, to be building one of these my, myself. Perfect. Um, uh, let's see here. Great job on the presentation. Need to leave class. Yes, there will be a recording. We'll be sending it out. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Um, would you suggest, Dee Dee says, would you suggest thawing frozen food out prior to adding it to the bin or just toss it in frozen. I often freeze veggie scraps for the worms. I think if it's easy, meal. whatever is easiest for you to do, I want to, I want to reduce the friction for people to be doing this. So I think that putting it in your worm bin 
frozen is fine. The one thing is, is if you're just doing, if you're just freezing food scraps and you put that in there into a worm bin, once it thaws, you're just going to have a lump of food waste. And then that's yeah. where you get the fermentation. That's where you might get a little bit of that anaerobic decomposition, which is when things yeah. start to smell. What you may do if you want to get fancy with it is take that food waste, add some paper waste to it. Uh, maybe even in that two to one, stick that in your freezer. And then when you take that stuff and put it in your worm bin and it thaws, then that, uh, that paper is already there to absorb that moisture that is going to be released much more quickly once it thaws. That's the perfect. thing I was saying with, with, the, with the freezing of the food waste, you get the expansion of that water, which breaks the cell walls. You don't know it because it's still solid, right? Because it's, it's, it's frozen. But once it thaws, it's going to break down much more rapidly than it would if you, than it would if you had just put that food waste in your worm bin. Perfect. That's an idea. I just came up with that on the fly. <laughs> nice. Love it. Um, Nadia says she's in Phoenix, just started about a month ago. Someone suggested freezing food waste. Uh, this would be helpful. Still create more food waste so that the worms can handle. Um, that's also a way to uh, cool it down in the summertime. Yes. So she's worried about keeping the little guys cool enough, freezing food waste, which we just talked about. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sure what the, uh, the the question was there, but I think what she's talking about doing is is seems fine to me. Yeah, yeah Free, freeze the food waste if you can't. I think it's freeze the food waste if you can't use it as quickly as you're making right. it. Yeah, right. Okay. Regina says my classroom is very cold and I cannot control the temperature. My bag has been at sixty five degrees. Are the worms going to be okay? I assume they may they'll break down food slower. They, they will be, they will be slower. One thing you can do is to feed it a little bit more to get that a little bit of microbial activity, uh, happening. Um, you can, you can of course, uh, use that seed starting mat, Regina, like, like, uh, we talked about, um, the 20 inch by 20 inch, uh, Vivo sun makes it. And, um, there is a link on yeah. my website to that, but, uh, yeah, I, that's what I would do. And, and the thing is, is, 65 degrees, you're, you're fine. Things are uh, processing and the worm activity is going to be a little bit slower than it would be at 75, but it's still, you're, you're honestly, the worms are going to survive just fine. They'll survive 45 degrees. They just won't reproduce and eat a whole lot. So, um, so somebody wants to know, do you have to shred the paper or you just tear it up? You can just tear it up. You can just tear it up. And again, if, if tearing up is the best you can do, then, then do that. I know not everybody wants to spend 70 bucks on a, you know, on a good shredder, but the, the smaller particle size without being so small that it's very fine, like sawdust is, is better. It's going to, you're, you're increasing the surface area of, of that paper by shredding it into smaller, smaller pieces. You're exposing yeah. the edges and the middles and all that, all that good stuff, rather than just like strips of, you know, little chunks of paper. Yeah. Kari wants to know what about grocery bags, cardboard grocery bags? Love Great. it like the like the brown brown paper yeah. grocery bags perfect perfect yeah. uh richard says i may be able to get a new printer in the next few months do you know if any of the printers would use toners or ink that would be acceptable to, well you can use the toners and inks in the urban worm bag i say that's not good because that's eventually going to be in our food and those chemicals are going to be in our food so richard you're just going to have to do some research on that to see what you can come up with you know, most of, most of the inks that we're actually bringing that, that we'd be using would not be produced by us in printers. Anyway, it's going to be mostly the mail, unless people are just printing a lot of stuff. Maybe you're at right. like a home office or something like that. Um, but most of the paper and, you know, I've, I've got a home office here. Most of the paper that I put in the bin has come to me through the mail. <laughs> so oh, junk mail. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, Mark wants to know about worm castings for cactus. Absolutely. I saw that question. That's a great, that's a great question. I know that, um, I believe that, that cactus and, and like succulents need very little water. They actually don't, shouldn't have a lot of water. Worm castings hold a lot of water. So I don't, I don't know about that. That's a really good question. I, I can't hazard a guess. Well, I'm going to say from the, for the biological life that it brings to the soil, it, that's an absolute, that'd be my take on it. Okay. Um, any, any, uh, herbs that there's a benefit to add herbs to the bin? I like to stay away from the things that are, that are aromatic, you know, something mm -hmm. like, like 
fennel like i i just do i know that they aren't good no um they're probably fine with when mixed with all sorts of other things but i think that the some some of these herbs and i again i'm, I'm out of my depth a little bit talking about this might have enzymes in them that are part of some of the things that actually create those smells if you can if you've got other things to put in your bin put those other things in the bin um and those herbs will decompose yeah. just fine in your yard or your regular compost pile there you go Lauren asked this question a long time ago, and now just now, I see a picture of a pill bug, roly poly, on your slide. Is it a co-composter or a pest? That is a co-composter, but I will say I've gotten a couple emails from folks that have just been like, "My worm bin is overrun with roly polies. I don't, I don't know what to do about them," and I'm not sure what to do about them either. One thing you can do: somebody asked about, uh, I saw a question earlier about diatomaceous earth, which is mm. a, a a powder. That is very. It actually feels very fine in your hands, but it's very abrasive to to ex, to, to uh, pests with exoskeletons. It actually makes them dehydrate to death. Um, you could put that food grade diatomaceous earth on the surface of your vermicompost, uh, sprinkle it on the surface, and and it's eventually it's going to get moist, which is going to reduce its effectiveness. But while it's still dry, if you're putting that right on any hard shell pest that you want to get rid of, it sh it will it will kill them. It may take a few days, but it will be it will be uh, fatal to to those hard shell pests in a, in a warm bin. Cool. Didi says, I have a circular three bin system and only feed the top one. Yet I find worms traveling down to the very bottom where there is no bedding. Yes. No, it's yes. just because they and, do. Well, they do because of two things, probably. Worms want organic matter and they want moisture. The bottom tray is probably the most moist. And if they are in organic matter, which includes their own worm poop, their own castings, worms will, worms will con consume their own castings. And so if you've got those two things, if you've got organic matter and moisture at the bottom, uh, then you are going to have, uh, you are going to, you're going to have worms there. So it would, does not surprise me at all. That's one of the reasons why I think, look, that the stackable worms work better in theory than they do. In practice, because they have that tap in the bottom, that makes people think that they ought to be getting leachate from the bottom right. of the worm bin. If yep. your worm bin is being run so wet that you get leachate out of the bottom, your worms are never going to be in the top of your worm bin. They're, they're always going to be in the bottom. And honestly, even the urban worm bag would work the same way, that if you're getting leachate kind of coming out of the bottom, you're soon going to have worms that are going to be right down there in the bottom of your urban worm bag too. Perfect. Perfect, perfect. Uh, Richard says, as an elder in a recognized Indian tribe, and Eva's and as a special knowledge holder, I have a great possibility to get all sorts of new computer related items. A new printer would be one of my choices as well as a paper shredder. All right, cool. Excellent. Um, Anonymous says onion skins and garlic. Aromatic. Yes. You, you, could you do it? Yes. I, I think, I think you can get, I think you can get away with it. All things in moderation. Yes. Um, you know, toxicity is always in the dose, right? We can overdose on water. Yeah. Um, people can die from drinking too much water. Uh, so if you, if, the, if it's just one of many things you're putting, putting in a, in a, in a worm bin, assuming that those other things have the right, uh, you know, uh, mixture of that bedding to, to food waste, I think that you're going to be fine putting that stuff in there, but, it, but again, not the main course. Perfect. Uh, anonymous says, which, ratio conversion of compost production uh for example if uh, i have no idea yeah, i, I guess I, I know what he's asking he's asking basically if i put in a given amount of stuff in a worm bin how much how much castings am i am i going to get out uh, you are going to get out most if, if you put in something like like leaf like that leaf mold almost everything that you put in with leaf mold, maybe aside from the stems and those, you know, kind of maybe woodier parts are going to come out as worm castings. If you're doing something like food waste, it's going to reduce in volume so much. So, so you're, and, and so much of it's water and it needs to get absor absorbed by that, that, uh, that bedding. You are going to get less out of a given amount of food waste and bedding than you would leaf compost. It's really one of those, I hate to say it depends, but it depends. It depends. Well, and that's it nature. Depends. Wow. Yeah. So that was 103 questions. Some of them were duplicates. What do I win? They are, right? <laughs> that is the most questions we've ever had. Awesome. So any final thoughts, Steve? No, I, I, um, 
you know, I, I, I love everybody's interest in this. I want people to, I want people to try it. I want people to maybe if, even if they fail, try it again. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the one thing I would say, and I said it in the, in the, is, is moisture is the, is the least one of the least sexy things to think about. People want to talk about, Ooh, what can I feed it? Well, okay. You can answer that in a bunch of different ways, but moisture is going to be one of the keys to successful vermicomposting. Uh, if it's too wet, it's going to, it's going to start getting stinky. Um, and it's going to be difficult to harvest. The urban worm bag wouldn't even work right. If you are way, way, way too wet with it, you're not adding that bedding. So, uh, don't try to save the world all at once. Understand when you start this, you're starting up that ecosystem. That's not going to be able to process the food waste as fast as you will be a few months later, once you've got that thriving community of, of, of microbes and earthworms, uh, that have, that have started reproducing. So be patient um, and moisture is, moisture is key. Excellent. And your email address, because there were a couple of people that were asking for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Steve at urbanwormcompany.com. Perfect. And if they want a, a bin, want to get their own bin, they can get it tonight for 10% off. And that link is? Uh, let's see. What was it? Urbanwormcompany.com forward slash urban farm. Awesome. Steve, and thank you. The, yep. Go ahead. No, and, and Urban Farm Ten is the uh, is the uh, coupon code uh, for that. Perfect, which they can get. Yeah, yeah, out there, Miss Janice. I'm here. Awesome, thank you, thank you, Steve. This was an amazing webinar. <laughs> Loved it. Had fun with it, Janice. Thank you for, uh, as always, for your management behind the scenes. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, well, guys. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Steve.